Microphone's on. Great. Uh, this, good afternoon. Um, we are back at it. Uh, House Transportation Committee on Thursday, February 16th, and we are returning um, from our lunch break and to look at the governor's proposed FY24 budget. Um, we have Bradley Kuchenberger in, who's our chief financial officer, and I think we're, we have a half hour to do a couple of things. Um, uh, that we wanted to talk about the town highway programs. We'd had um, uh, some discussion 10 days ago, we think it was, <laughs> just to put a, a bow on some of the, some of that to um, to really be sure that we're clear about that. And then I think there's, you were also going to speak about um, municipal education and, and, um, and better back roads. Is that correct? We're on the same page? Okay. Right. So let's start. Um, you can introduce yourself for the record. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I'm Bradley Kuchenberger. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Agency of Transportation. I'm happy to be back. And uh, we took some time since we last talked about the Town Highway Grant Program, specifically the Class Two roadway and structures, um, and did a deep dive into some of the data that we pull and or track and maintain out of uh, the municipal highway grant system and thought it'd be um, interesting to show you. So I've passed out hard copies, but it's also on the documents of the committee uh, section of the legislator's website um, and put it on the screen here. First is a summary of the last three fiscal years of the town highway class two roadway and town highway structures programs. So what I'm trying to demonstrate uh, from the agency perspective is one that we've awarded um, all of the appropriations that we receive in a given fiscal year and also demonstrate the um, how the current year expenditures for the projects that we do award grants to the municipalities for actually flows and what creates the um, kind of annual surplus scenario that we requested as reversion in the FY24 budget adjustment. So really the main points are to demonstrate that we award every dollar that were appropriated in these programs and that we um, fund those commitments. Um, on the following pages, uh, beyond the summary, I've listed out for your own perusal the actual, some examples of the projects that we award through 21, 22, and 23, the, the various programs. And um, you can you can review those or maybe we'll go through an example one together um, but you can review those at your own leisure to see what kind of projects there are and kind of how it all works but i think ultimately i wanted to demonstrate um, the fact that this program is kind of always in a, in arrears in paying for the commitments because it's a reimbursement program for the projects that actually occur um, and so if we take, for example, um, the Town Highway Class 2 Roadway Program on the summary page, um, we used FY21 uh, as a way to kind of demonstrate how the program works. So we pause the awards and allotments that we give out to municipalities in 21 due to the budget constraints uh, as a result of the pandemic. and. Even though we paused those programs and did not award any additional, but for I think one one project for $175,000 that was left over from the year before, um, we still had to have an appropriation to pay for the previous year's expenditures. And by previous years, it could be multiple years. Um, and so another way of thinking of this is if theoretically at some point in the future, these programs morphed into something else and ended in the way that they're set up now, there would have to be an appropriation the following year to pay for 
the remainder of those projects. So I think fiscal year 21 is a perfect example of that. So then if we move into fiscal year 22, we're, we're kind of demonstrating that in class two roadway and town highway structures, the appropriation was 15.3 million and 12.6 million respectively. We awarded um, in those specific years, uh, 14.8 and 12.25 um, in those years, you'll see that the numbers in 23 are higher than our appropriations and those balance out to what our appropriations were. And in some cases, we award a little bit more than were appropriated because of the nature of construction projects and how uh, things either accelerate or decelerate based on the actual conditions. We've also shown then that the current year expenditures are always significantly lower. Um, and this, this trend date back, dates back to the beginning of the program really, and that the actual cost for the reimbursement of the projects that are at construction um, in a given fiscal year create a surplus situation. Now, that leaves us with a question at the next fiscal year. So if we're looking at fiscal year 22, which is what is demonstrated in the FY23 BAA and the FY24 budget, we came up with a surplus uh, of 5.7 million in fiscal year 22 in roadway and 9.6 million in structures. And that's just a cash surplus. And of that, we reverted. Um, we, we chose to carry forward about a million in roadway and 866,000 in structures and proposed to revert the remainder of those dollars to use um, on the cash basis for additional investments in the state infrastructure. And we were able to make that choice because we look forward into fiscal year 23 and notice that we would be in a um, just a, a perfectly fine budget scenario with reverting those funds and still being able to pay um, the commitments that we expected were coming due in fiscal year 23. And um, you'll notice that we're still in a surplus situation um, as we're coming towards the end of fiscal year 23, certainly um, well past the prime time of construction season in that particular fiscal year. So it looks as if we'll be faced with a similar choice and analysis in fiscal year 23 on what to do with those surplus cash funds. Uh, we haven't, and we won't until the fiscal year closes really dig into that analysis, but we'll either choose to carry forward the balance to pay for the next year's commitments, or we'll revert them or some combination thereof will be a recommendation. We have a question from Representative Shaw. So, uh, Brad, I'm wondering if the term surplus is confusing. Yeah. Because in my, what I think I've heard is you grant, you allocate, you know, but you don't appropriate all the funds in the grant in the, yeah. in the grant year. So the funds aren't really surplus, they're committed funds, but not being used in the year that they were allocated, a uh, year that they were budget yeah I, I would agree with that representative I think it I, I should have written that it's a it's a cash surplus so this was trying to demonstrate that we committed all of those funds but we don't expect to have to reimburse all those funds in 23 and I think that's where the confusion yeah, yeah. So we call it something else in the next yeah year. Certainly. Or, or on the spreadsheet. Yeah. It's to BLCP. For sure. We, we, we will, uh, I can change that terminology. Yeah. And, and of course, we, we've had a continuing discussions with the LCT and um, we've come to an agreement that will be more uh, proactive in our communications and our plans. And the, and the point credit card surplus. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Way I look at yeah, it, yeah, no, it is can it down is. the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, has BLCP seen this yet? Uh, yes, yeah. I've uh, presented this similar document yesterday to okay. such so transportation. And yesterday, looking for yeah, and so I think they these have been 
publicly circulated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Representative Poach. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll um, refer to what Representative Cochran said. We kind of are kicking the can down the road. I mean, it <laughs> seems like we appropriate the money, you give, you award that grant amount in that amount. Obviously, the town doesn't spend it all, so there's some of that money has is unspent. A small portion you carry forward, and then the rest of it goes back into the transportation budget. So, in in effect, the following year, uh, you need to reappropriate the money to finish those projects. Uh, I would agree with the concept of what you said representative what i would disagree on is the timing so these projects have in some cases a multi-year window of reimbursement and it, it is that um, i wouldn't phrase it that we're kicking the can down the road is that we've made commitments to town that we will honor 100 percent. it's that we don't need to um, tie up that cash in a specific fund to wait for those payments to come due while we can reinvest them in a different place. Um, there will always be payments in arrears in this program uh, until it would ever hypothetically come to an end, which I'm not proposing at all, but just in a conceptual ma manner, it, there will always be um, a tail and of things to for this appropriation. You, yeah, so yeah, I it doesn't, you know, it, for me, it just doesn't feel, it feels like if we appropriate the money, we should have it there so when it's time, rather than wait for the next year to again allocate the money to finish the bill. But, hmm. Understood. Well, I think there's, I mean, there's sometimes I mean, this, let me just clarify, this is not a new practice. This is something that we have done as a way to manage, you know, it's almost like a cash flow manage, management. And so if some, we heard, and correct me Bradley if I'm wrong, we heard that like, you know, some towns like think they're going to do projects, some, some don't. So putting, putting aside that money for projects that don't happen then also means that we can't do projects that could happen. I mean, that's the other, that's the downside of like, if we were to just hold money on the side for 30 months, right? Like for, which is potentially the window that projects can potentially be completed within. Correct. And, and it's a similar practice to how we operate with FHWA. So we are in, uh, in the relationship with FHWA, we are the, the towns in this scenario and they are the state and they do the same exact thing is that we we obligate funds and they authorize us to obligate funds towards a project um but they don't they don't give us the money until we actually have expenditures due and i think it's really the nature of how all large-scale infrastructure transportation projects are funded and it's a it's a common practice and how you get the most projects out of it, out of your your given uh, limited resources as you can, right? So there's there is um, a cost benefit to both holding those funds in reserve, and there's a cost benefit to operating the practice that we propose as well. It's, and we've chosen to request that this we think the uh, costs are lesser. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just to play devil's advocate for a moment, is, is there a percentage of projects that just end up never getting built or completed? Maybe? Um, I cannot answer that question. Um, I can get back to you, though, with the pro program managers who will have a better understanding of what those percentages are. Um, but what I can say is, for example, I believe it's in structures. We have projects that have been awarded, but haven't 
uh, accrued any expenditures or completed their full expenditure since FY 2017. So that's those are the old subset of projects in our um, grant commitment bucket, if you will. So in 23, for example, we have current year expenditures of projects that began in 2018 and forward. And, and those are demonstrated below. So why don't I just yeah, I was going to ask you if you could like just why don't we use um, examples of what off this, the detail. I'm going to skip past uh, the first 2021 sheet and move to the last section. I think it should be on page. Um, oh, geez, I forgot the page numbers right here. One, two. It'll be on page 11 second to last page. We'll look at the FY23 town highway structures to give you an example of what um, what some of the information I give you means. It's Arlington on the top is the project. Arlington on the top and uh, in the top left hand corner it should say FY23 TH structures. So um, this and the following page are all of the projects that were allotted in fiscal year 23. This doesn't show the previous year's allotments that are still in our basket of uh, future receivables. So you have the um, first column is project allotment. So that's how much of grants were awarded to that particular project. The second column is the total estimated project costs, which we keep for reference for future um, the, the balance between either the amount we've awarded and the project estimated cost would be um, assumed by the, the towns in this case. And then we have the current year expenditures. So you'll see for a number of, of projects, even though we've awarded those grants, they haven't gone to construction because they do have an extended timeline in which to obligate. Um, and so you have the town the specific town in the middle column and then the column at the far right has a brief description on what the project would be for. So, um, and we're halfway through this fiscal year. I mean, we're just a Yeah, past. we're for, for all extents and purposes, we're for construction projects and we're almost all the way through the year. Oh, okay. because, um, the spring construction season is the way the fiscal years come up. You know, June is the cutoff date. Um, and often, depending on the nature of our winter, um, you might see a, an abbreviated spring construction cycle, which will generate some cost reimbursement for us. But the majority of our costs would have already occurred in these programs. Okay. Did I see a hand over Representative Burke? Yeah, so there's no danger, I assume, of somebody, uh, because of the timing, like been on the book since 2017, all of a sudden finding that the money that was awarded to them is not available. No danger whatsoever. And I think that was, thank you for putting that point on it, because that's what the, you know, the fear was, that there's no danger. Right. The, the awards have been made. There's no danger that that money is going away. Yeah. This is really, this is really an accounting. Um, yeah. So, well, if the committee feels satisfied, um, yeah. uh, for, for this, no, yeah, I'm not satisfied, but, but it is. But it is this is what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the only question: Have we ever run? I mean, doing it. I mean, this seems like it's the common practice for the. the agency and have we ever deficit spent? No. Okay. We do have Bradley to, to go. Well, this will be the last yes. question. Yeah, one yeah. last question. So the the in FY 21, though, that was one year because of the pandemic where we didn't allocate all of the, the funds. Uh, we did not allocate any new funds, right, in 2021, okay. but we had a small appropriation to pay for previous years, yes. funds, which we had spent down.
Okay. So yeah, I'm making those two. Yeah, I think I think we're settled on, on that. And I know we had we were having to come in for a twofer today. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so we're going to switch gears and talk about um, a technical correction that we're requesting in the municipal litigation assistance and better back roads. Um, Section so it's tab two of the white book or tab twenty two excuse me of the white book and um, in the language is in the T bill and the language is in the T bill so uh, we we attempted to correct it in the white book um, and I replaced funds instead of some uh, the total of what we needed so. We look on t uh, tab 22, it's the Muni Municipal Mitigation Assistance Program. Up on the screen is how it was presented to you and it's in your binders. Um, and in fact, there should be additional funds in the Federal Revenue Fund and the Clean Water Fund for this appropriation. Um, and they are written as follows. It's, it's section um, one, subsection C, titled technical correction in the, what is the latest draft that I am aware of from Anthea of the TIBO, the draft 1.5. 1, 1. I don't think we have this post this because she has not walked through the new language but um, oh so the, i pulled this off the committee's website so yeah, you guys, oh you have it i have it's it it's on oh okay great okay because there, there, there's some a couple of other things i'm maybe. assuming there'll be subsequent updates but this is the latest that okay great so it's not the, i was aware of um and really what we're doing is adding uh one million four hundred twenty uh one million four hundred twenty-eight thousand to the federal revenue line item in FY twenty-four, and we're adding a million to the clean water fund line item. And I can give you a short breakout of what these. Uh, Do you want to make it a little bit bigger? Oh yeah, yeah. My, 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 yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, section twenty-two. So this might yeah, okay. So this this number will it via the technical correction read four million seven eighty three five twenty three and that is uh in that federal revenue line item it is just for the municipal highway and stormwater mitigation programming so we match um, some non-federal funds with federal funds that allow us to program municipal highway and stormwater mitigation projects um, and we Ask for too little in the federal revenue line item there. So section one C corrects that to a total of four million seven eighty three five twenty three. Additionally, um, in the section right below the clean water fund, um, and this was approved by the clean water board. Uh, who manages these clean water funds. The full FY24 appropriation should be $5 million instead of $4 million. So $3 million goes to grants and aid. And this is for um, basically stormwater runoff type projects uh, throughout the state and our municipalities. 1 million goes to the, the Better Roads grants. And 1 million is a match um, which was a congressionally directed spending, I believe, for the Missis Missisquoi Basin. I believe that was a Senator Sanders project, which we were able to match with clean water funds of $1 million. Um, 
Would you mind saying it's, it's, yeah, what was the first number? Was it three? Three, three million for grants and aid. We're not seeing those numbers right now, right? No, I'm okay. just describing them. So the, uh, so, uh, this, so the four million is with this language will be changed to, to five million. Yeah. Water fund, and that was approved by the Clean Water Board. That was Correct. part of their Okay. Yeah, and um, what I would say is if you do have specific questions about those programs and those dollars, Joel Pergo will be in your committee next Tuesday, I believe. And I conferred with him before a meeting with you today, and, and he's a better liaison for describing the specifics of the projects. Um, and just to round it out, the we are not asking for any change to the transportation fund line of 705,000. And those that's broken out into two separate pots. Uh, there's 440,000 for the Better Back Roads initiative and uh, 265,000 um, goes to make our stormwater utility payments for, um, for those necessary assets across the state. And that, that has been, that is not a change from 23. We're, we're continuing the same amount of funding in those programs. And, and while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to follow up with you on, I'll, I'll send an email to make sure you have that breakout written out that I just described. That'd be great. And I believe that was what we were here to discuss at this point in time, but then if you want to. Right, and so this was a technical correction, and will it, it will be, I guess, uh, it doesn't change the overall picture, the overall budget, right? It's just, a, no. it's just really just a type of. It really doesn't, yeah. Right. In fact, the if you take all of the technical corrections that we made from um, updating the white books and this one included the total transportation budget we requested is 858 million either way you slice it the, there's a little bit of difference in the other numbers but say that last part again it's there's there's a small difference in the in the like hundreds of thousands line but it 858 million dollar budget it doesn't change and it doesn't impact any state fund expenditures Questions from the committee? All right. So this will be when we, when we go through, um, we'll be going through the policy. This, you know, this is this is the time to ask. Yeah, go ahead. You said the total funds that we see on this sheet in the white book, which is up in front, yeah. is 855, 887 is what the request. Yeah, with and with these technical corrections, it'll be eight hundred fifty-eight million. Eight hundred fifty-eight. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, if there are no other questions, I think we will thank you, Bradley, for our time that. Appreciate you coming in with more detail on the um, topic. Of course, and if there's anything that you think of uh, that you want to discuss, please reach out. Uh, we'll take it as soon as we can, and I'll get you a breakout of fiscal mitigation item that we discussed. But thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and so with that, we, we're going to. We're spending the day with Jesse. Has everyone recovered? Yeah. <laughs> We're ready. I needed to give my voice a little break. Okay, yeah. I know it's a, it's a long time for, for you to talk that through. Um, so, welcome back. Give you a second to get settled. Give me a second to clear my desk. So we're gonna for the committee we're we're sticking with our our white books. Um, and 
And so, Jesse, what section are you going to be? What, which, which section would you like to continue? So, the, we completed paving and roadway this morning, and the last program for me is traffic and safety, which is tab 5E. I probably should have, once we get work, we can, I should have asked you to identify yourself. Yep. So for the record, my name is Jesse Devlin. I am the program manager for the highway safety and design section at VTrans. And we'll be continuing kind of the line by line look at the funding profile for the traffic and safety program for the FY24 budget. Um, similar to this morning, we'll utilize the summary sheets that are located um, at the start of tab 5E. And I'll walk through the projects, give a general high level scope um, overview of kind of what type of project it is, what benefits in, and um, what kind of funding we're proposing in FY24. So if the committee is ready, I will get to it. Let's go. Okay. So first project on the list is in Arlington, and this is an intersection improvement project at the intersection of Route 313 and Warmbrook Road. Uh, this is proposing the installation of a roundabout at this site. Um, we're proposing PE or design funds in FY24. The next project on the list is in Barry City, and this is an intersection realignment improvement at the Vermont 14 and Merchant Street intersection. Um, we have construction funding proposed in FY24, and this is a primary construction in calendar 23. Uh, Barry City, Barry Town. Um, this is a um, an asset level project that works to uh, replace or upgrade existing traffic signals. Uh, this is two signals, uh, one on 62 and one at, on 63. And this is listed as a DE project with PE funding and FY24. In Barry Town, we have a project on Vermont 14 at the intersection of Bridge Street and Sterling that'll make intersection improvements. We're showing PE and a right of way within fiscal year 24. In Bennington, we have a project that is listed in DE. This is a VPSB2. Uh, regionally proposed project. So again, this is a project that's going through a um, essentially a project refinement as the initial stage. This is at the intersection of Route 7 and um, and 7A. That's Kosher Drive. And so that's proposing a roundabout. In Bennington, uh, we have a, a similar signal upgrade or replacement project. Um, that is uh, also a DE project. We're proposing PE funding in FY24. Around it for that first one, a roundabout on Kosher Drive. Where? So, this is at the, the basically the main intersection of 7 and 7A. All right, because there's one up a little further for Walmart. Uh, yep, yeah, so this, this is a new, this would be a new installation of a roundabout. There isn't one there currently. Yeah. Do we currently own the land there? Is that where the state bought the land? Um, no. 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 This is this, that's a separate location. Okay. I believe I was that's. Trying to picture because I've been getting a lot of actually um, feedback from the business owners that would like to see roundabouts on that stretch. So there is going to be one. I was just trying to actually get them in my mind where that is. But it, yeah. So there's there. actually a, another project. I think it's a. Um, well, actually, two down. Jeez, Tim. I can't keep track. You got so much going on down there. No, I was, I was just, uh, I mean, I guess I talked you offline and bug you down, but I was just trying to get a better idea of what that was. Yeah, so there's a, there's another project. It's, um, let me see, as we're jumping down, uh, the Bennington SDP 0137 print 20. So that is another VPSB2 regionally proposed project that would look to um, install additional roundabouts at Northside, and I believe it's Hicks. Yeah, so that's, 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 that reports do this yeah. summer. Yeah, I yeah. knew about that one, but I didn't know about the coaster drive. All right, that's right. Thank you. So I think the, the project I skipped in between those two is a sign replacement project on 279. 
So within the traffic and safety program, we also have um, uh, sign replacement projects that serve to upgrade and replace aging signs that have reached their useful life. So that's a project that we have construction funding in FY24, and that's a calendar 23 project. Um, also in- Sorry. Yes. Sorry. So like two, over two and a half million dollars, that's a, are those, you know, lights or what do you mean by sign? So these are sign replacement yes. projects. So I, I believe in Bennington, these also have overhead signs. So that would be like a sign bridge that's, pla that's placed on it. And sometimes with those types of installs, the new requirements for signs have resulted in larger signs. That also means we may need to upgrade some features like that. So that's unique for a lot of sign jobs, but I know in Bennington that is uh, a feature that will be replaced as well. Big number. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, that's, that's, like, oh, that's a big sign. <laughs> and 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 just to clarify, we're not talking it's about nowhere. It's a big road. Yeah, to nowhere. Uh, what's that? Big road to nowhere. Oh, uh, it's been it's, it's been on the hunter response that we're on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't think of this as a sign either. This is a yeah. corridor, so it's it, it's a significant length of roadway that. We're replacing all the signs within that. Like signage. Yes. Yeah, but okay. it's a major in yeah. 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 It's like okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a big number. <laughs> You'll get yours, don't worry. Oh <laughs> so staying in Bennington, um, we have an intersection improvement project at the intersection of uh, 67A, Silk, and Matson. And that is a project where we're proposing a roundabout. Um, within FY24, we have construction funding shown, and that's a calendar 24 start. Um, the next project down is Bennington Signal 63. Uh, this will go in coordination with the signal project noted above, and it would uh, replace or upgrade six existing traffic signals on Vermont 7A. This is a DE project that is. Uh, working through the PE phase. Burlington Montpelier, this is similar, a asset project that would replace or upgrade six signals um, along US 302 and Vermont 62. Also a DE project working through PE and design in FY24. Uh, Bradford St. Johnsbury, uh, this will replace uh, two signals, um, the US 591 signal, US 5 and Vermont 25. That's a DE project that would, um, we're working through PE. We are anticipating we might be able to uh, begin construction in 24 on that one. I just, I, I just want to, I wrote roundabout on two Bennington projects, is that correct? One's a scoping, one's... Okay. There, there's actually three. Oh, what's that, the third one? So here? if we're jumping back up, yes. we have Bennington NH0191 yep. print 30. Yep. Yep. And then we have uh, Bennington STP0137 print That's 20. Okay. Yes. And then the one right below. Correct. Okay, thank you. But potentially two more. We'll just study this. I mean, we're spending an awful lot of money on this. I feel like just starting into France. So in Brattleboro, we have another signal replacement job. This is at US 5 and CNS Grocers. Um, and that's a DNA project. We're working through PE. In Burlington, we have a project at the intersection of Colchester Ave, uh, Barrett, and Mill. That's down by the uh, the Winooski Bridge that heads towards the circulator in Williston. So the intersection right before that bridge. That was a regionally proposed project and we're working through the project refinement currently and is listed as a DE project. Also in Burlington, similar category being a VPSB2 regionally proposed project in DE. We have the intersection at Colchester and Prospect Street, and that's over. Um, by the UVM campus as we're heading down towards the waterfront. In Castleton to Middlebury, um, we have a signal upgrade or replacement project that would work on three existing traffic signals. 
Um, we have PE funds in, in fiscal year 24. That's listed as a DE project. In Cavendish, we have a regionally proposed project that's working through the project refinement stage. It's listed in DE, and that's for improvements to the intersection of Vermont 103 and Vermont 131. In Colchester, um, this project is the diverging diamond interchange at exit 16. So this is actually the second phase of that contract. Um, it's showing PE right of way and construction funds in FY24. This phase of the project is anticipated to begin in calendar 24. Uh, the next project down is the contract one, the first phase of that project. Um, it's under construction now. And again, this phase includes some of the utility work um, along with retaining wall construction and um, some uh, ledge work that will essentially set the stage for the full project construction. So as noted, um, this they are actively constructing this winter. So we're showing construction funds in FY24 and we anticipate that uh, being primarily completed this calendar year. Um, in Colchester, we have another VPSB2 project. Um, this is at the intersection of 127 and Bayside. And this is a site that um, a roundabout is being proposed as well. Okay, so jumping to the reverse of that same page, I'm staying in Colchester. We have improvements to the intersection of US Route 7 and Severance. And we are showing PE and right of way within fiscal year 24. Uh, Colchester Essex, this is along the Vermont 15 corridor, and it's it's serving to um, replace or upgrade the existing signal systems. And this would be in coordination with the uh, paving project that we talked about earlier as well. The next project is kind of a line item for a crash reporting, and this funding um, assists with maintaining and ensuring that we have a system that can collect the data associated with um, crashes that occur on the system. Statewide. Statewide, correct. Uh, Derby Newport, this is another asset level project that will work to replace or upgrade uh, signal systems. There's three proposed with this project, um, 191 and Western, US 5 and Quarry, and US-5 and Shattuck. This is a DE project with PE funding in FY24. Jesse, could I go interrupt you to, to go back one? So I'm, I'm noticing with most of these projects, with the exception of very few, it's federal funding that we're drawing down for these projects. So with the crash reporting, I see though that that's one that we that we have state funds. And, and can you just explain the rationale behind what, what what um, would require a state um, match in that case? Yep, yeah, so within the traffic and safety program in general, again, the, the primary scope of projects is safety and mobility. And with our FHWA funds, um, there is a large amount of funds that we get to be 100% federal that would be meeting safety initiatives and meet a safety scope. <laughs> And there's um, certain categories where there's an increased federal share that would would kind of bump it from our typical 80 federal 20 state split to a 90 10. So oh. this is a pro this is an so this is one initiative that would fall into that increased federal share, but would still have some state funds um, <coughs> tacked to it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you'll see as you go through the majority, yeah, majority. majority of this program is 100% federal. Um, there's a, a select few projects that would have some state funding. Okay, thank you for helping me understand that. Okay, so uh, continuing down the list, we have um, Essex. This is improvements to the intersection of uh, 117 and North Williston Road. And this, this project includes the installation of a signal with some turn lanes um, associated with the intersection. We're showing PE and right of way within fiscal year 24. Um, staying in Essex, we have improvements to the intersection of Sand Hill Road and Vermont 15, which includes a signal, some geometric improvements and some pedestrian 
facilities. We're showing PE and a right of way in fiscal year 24. In Fairfax, we have another regionally proposed project um, that's working through project refinement. It's listed in D and E and is located at the intersection of Vermont 104 and Vermont 128. In Hartford, we have a project at the intersection of US 5 and US 4. And this is proposing a roundabout at this location. Um, we're showing PE and a right of way within fiscal year 24. Staying in Hartford, and I realized a, an error with the description here. It's actually duplicating what it says above. But this is actually a, a, an intersection improvement at three locations in Hartford along US 5. Um, this is at the intersection with Veterans Drive, as well as the ramps for I-91 northbound and southbound. And that is listed as a DE project with PE funding in uh, FY24. Staying in, in Hartford, we have a signal replacement or upgrade project um, also along US 5. This includes three signals and it's um, essentially at the, the, the intersection before it crosses over towards the downtown section and then again uh, heading up the hill at the high school in Hartford. In Jericho, we have a VPSB2 project that will be undergoing the project refinement. This is at Route 117 and Skunk Hollow Road. In Londonderry, same category, D&E, uh, VPSB2, and this is at the intersection of Vermont 100 and Middletown Road. In Linden, we have a signal project that will, um, asset level project that will replace or upgrade existing signals. There's uh, two within that project that's listed as D&E with PE funding. In Middlebury, we have a project at the intersection of US Route 7 and Exchange Street that's proposing a roundabout at the, that location. Um, we're showing PE and right of way within fiscal year 24. In Middlebury, <clears throat> we have an intersection improvement project at US 7 and Boardman. This is a DE project that again falls into that BPSB2 project refinement category. In Middlebury, we have a, a similar project, DE, VPSB2 project refinement at the intersection of US 7, uh, Monroe, and Charles. In Milton, we have a, an intersection improvement project at the intersection of US 7 and Railroad Street that will be installing signals and making some realignment of the existing intersection. Um, we're showing construction funding in FY24, and um, the primary activities on that will be um, undergoing in, in calendar 25. So in Milton, um, we also have a, a project that falls into that VPSB2 category, uh, D&E, and this is at the intersection of US 7 and Racine, Legion, and Barrett. In Morristown, we have a VPSP2 project listed in DE that's undergoing the project refinement at the intersection of the alternate Route 100 and Stafford Ave intersection. In New Haven, we have a project at the intersection of Vermont 17 and, and East Street. Uh, this project will be uh, making some vertical alignment improvements to Vermont 17 to improve site distance and um, removing a Y intersection and creating a T intersection. And this project shows construction funding in FY24 and will be under construction this calendar year. So moving on to the next page, uh, the first project on the list is in Norwich, and this is a signal upgrade or replacement project along 2A and US 5 and includes three um, intersections or signals. This project shows construction funding. It was under construction this past year and will continue uh, carry over into this year. In Plainfield, we have an intersection improvement project at the 
intersection of US Route 2 and Main Street. And we are showing PE and right of way within fiscal year 24. Pownal Dorset. So this is a sign replacement, a corridor sign replacement project along US Route 7. Um, this has construction funding in FY24 and will be under construction in calendar 23. In Rutland Town, we have a signal replacement job uh, at the intersection of US 7 and Cold River Road. Um, we have construction funding in FY24, and that will be under construction in calendar 23. In Shelburne, we have a regionally proposed project um, that's listed in DE and is undergoing project refinement stage um, as we speak, and this is at the intersection of US Route 7 and Harbor Road. In South Burlington, same category, regionally proposed project will undergo a project refinement, and this is at the intersection of Route 116 and Cheese Factory Road. Uh, we're showing PE funds in FY24. The next project is in South Burlington, and this is a municipally managed project. And this is uh, for some signal improvements <coughs> at the exit 14 um, interchange. Bless you. In Springfield, we have another regionally proposed project that will undergo project refinement. It's listed in d and &E and is looking at four intersections in Springfield along Route 100. Uh, the intersections are at the intersection with 106, with Valley Road, with Summer, and with South Street. In St. Albans, we have improvements to the Vermont 104 um, exit 19 intersection. Um, the initial proposal is a roundabout at this location. It's listed as d and &E, and we're showing PE funds within FY24. St. Albans Town, where this is another signal asset um, replacement upgrade project. We have two signals within this project. Um, we're showing construction funding in FY24 and physical construction we anticipate in calendar year 24. In St. George, we have a project at the intersection of Vermont 116 and Vermont 2A. Um, the proposal here is a roundabout. We're showing PE funds within FY24, and that's a DNA project. So we're, we're transitioning into the statewide now. So I'm going to take this and ask questions as you will. I'll try to kind of summarize and uh, work through it. Um, the first project listed is the Governor's Highway Safety Program. And this is kind of a, a line item that really works to uh, focus on statewide behavioral highway safety. And it contributes funds towards education, impaired driving, seatbelt use, and really goes towards those uh, more behavioral side of, of roadway safety. The next project down is HRRR Print 25. And this is improvements on the local network that help to identify and delineate and make improvements to um, curves that may be of higher risk on the local network. So that has construction funding in FY24 and is anticipated to be under construction in calendar year 23. Similarly, we have uh, another HRRR project, PRIN 26, um, that we are working on PE in FY24. And the next project down, and this gets to the question from um, the session earlier this morning about safety, you'll see the designation of HSIP, and that refers to Highway Safety Improvement uh, Plan. And this, we have several line items within this budget that work to do several things around safety. It works to really collect data and understand what the safety needs are on our system. It provides funding to um, have staff and consultants help with that effort. It defines money that will um, work to look at that safety data and identify projects on the state system that are more systemic in nature, meaning 
it, it may not be resulting in crashes at that location, but the underlying characteristics of the road, whether that's the, the sharpness of a curve or the delineation of a curve or the uh, steepness of a roadside may be of uh, a higher risk. So we're looking for more of a, a programmatic way where we can address some of these higher risk locations. And that's both on the state network and the rural local network and also providing some opportunities for municipalities to identify these types of issues on on their roads and identify funding that can be used to make those types of repairs so we're jumping back to the question from earlier this morning in terms of how the safety data is being used this hsip program is really trying to take it to the next step where instead of just looking at some of those higher crash locations which may result in improvements that are absolutely valid and necessary but they're larger scale projects at higher volume roadways and in higher um, you know populated areas with the hsip it's really looking at that statewide data and trying to identify the countermeasures that we can apply across the system as a whole and also identifying still identifying those site specific type of treatments that will um, help to reduce crashes across the network and we're also using this information you know jumping back to the paving discussion for earlier this morning we're using this in developing you know the scope for those projects as well because you think about um, some systemic type countermeasures we're talking about uh, centerline rumble stripes flattening slopes you know, those types of elements that we're incorporating on more than just safety projects. We're doing them across the board. Okay, so the, the next project down is this uh, statewide SHSP project. And this is the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. And similar to HSIP, um, it kind of develops that framework for safety priorities for the agency. It's, de it's developing some of the key emphasis areas that we want to focus on. So these could be things like um, intersections, bike ped safety, run off the road type crashes. And those are some examples of the emphasis areas we, we've been looking at and trying to develop countermeasures for. So uh, I kind of touched on HSIP as a whole, um, but kind of just jumping through we have print 11 and that's really focused on a lot of the data analysis uh, print 13 this is really the some of the staffing the funding for staffing to assist with um, the data collection the data analysis and the screening turning the page over print 15 so this is looking at um, systemic type projects um, for our system, uh, print 16 is systemic type projects um, on the local network. So again, that those activities would be helping to identify key locations that we can advance as a project. HSIP print 17. So this is the municipal funding that I was talking about. We anticipate um, being able to open this up for uh, the municipalities to identify locations that are key from a safety perspective to to them and would meet certain criteria associated with safety as a whole in terms of the countermeasures that we're looking to implement and would uh, provide some some funding to municipalities to complete that work. It can it can be any kind of road. I mean, it can be on any kind, like a dirt road, a paved road. Correct. So, so with the HSIP effort, we're really trying to get to the data driven. So, if if there's a site that meets, you know, certain criteria in terms of curves or delineation, and um, you know, it's not on the municipal program for improvements, it's an opportunity to apply for this funding and um, get see those improvements made. Um, we're still working through the details of what this looks like. It's not set up yet, but that's the intent with it. So it's a new program. Yes. Okay. Okay. Other questions? I'm sorry, Representative Pouch. Yeah, thank you. Um, on all these safety programs, like the Governor's Highway Safety Program, um, is there any uh, money 
allocated for enforcement. You know, I understand seatbelt, education, and that kind of stuff, but is there any particular money uh, toward enforcement, speed enforcement? Uh, I'll, I'll need to check if there's actually money allocated to perform that work. So Vermont State Police and law enforcement are their major players in terms of the, the safety, um, the governor's highway safety plan, as well as development of the strategic highway safety plan. So they have a seat at our table. And in terms of those specific line items, I can get back to you on whether there's money set aside for law enforcement. But I will say on individual projects, and this is more on the construction side of things, we do um, uh, for higher impact projects set aside funding to perform work in the enforcement of our work zones. So, right. you know, we do have that component included as well. To, uh, to your question, just, we'll, we'll, we, we can hear about that later from, there's a, I can't remember the name of the office, can't help me really, but it's all that. Office of Highway Safety? Highway Safety, yeah. Yeah, that's cleverly named. Yeah, so the, the Traffic and Safety Program, to that point, there's a lot of a lot of groups within the agency that contribute to safety and have a hand in safety. And Governor's Highway Safety Program and the SHSP in particular are housed within a different uh, bureau than ours. So the Office of Highway Safety sounds like they will be in and they be able to provide a little bit more context for the, the ins and outs of those efforts. Okay, great, thank you. And then, then, then we'll hear about enforcement program most many towns belong to the, the program and they actually get money for participating in this program right so, like speed signs so that's what, uh, yeah that's what like. cost a little bit of a cost Great. so it's just kind of continuing down the hsip i think we were at uh, parenthesis 18 so this is work to identify those projects that would be more of the site specific. So an individual point location that we'd be looking at to make uh, improvements. And the last HSIP line item is for the uh, safety network screening tool. And this is kind of the, the overarching uh, effort that we're getting to with the HSIP in terms of the data collection and being able to feed that into a tool that helps to influence how projects are selected and advanced. So the next project down, this is a pavement marking project on the interstate. Um, we're showing construction funding pro uh, in fiscal year 24. That's a calendar year 23 project. Um, the, the, the next project down is a line item for that same work that would be able to start design efforts for the next year's project as that is an annual contract. Um, the statewide OBDS program, this is, these are uh, the administration of the program for the official business directional signs. So you know, on our roadway system, every sign needs to be MUTCD compliant. So business, businesses have the, the option of applying for a standard sign that would direct um, users to the business, but it, so that is uh, the pro that that money is essentially utilized to um, administer that program. I see that's one of the ones where it's like state money. Yes, yeah. correct. Um, the next project down is a line item for the development of um, sign projects. Continuing down a statewide line item for signal maintenance. We have a line item for pavement marking. So this would be more on the state system. We have statewide HRRR24. Again, this is um, local system um, in uh, sign installations and pavement markings to improve uh, localized safety. We have construction funding in FY24. Construction will occur in calendar 23. We have a statewide line item for projects within this program that are to be determined. We have a statewide um, Northeast region marking project. So again, this is on 
for projects on the state system, class one and class two town highways. And we have construction funding in FY24. This is a calendar year 23 construction project. Uh, similarly, we have a Northeast project and a South project. All of those have construction funding in FY24, calendar year 23 construction. Next project on the list is in Stowe. This is a regionally proposed project that's advancing through project refinement. Um, it's in the D, D and E phase, and it is at the intersection of Vermont 108 and Loose Hill Road. Staying in Stowe, we have a signal installation at the intersection of Vermont 100 and West Hill Road. Uh, this was under construction this past year and is carrying over into the current year. Stowe Cambridge, this is on 108 and is a DE project that is looking at potential alternatives to the uh, challenge of <laughs> um, stuck trucks on the notch. Yep. It's our new favorite word for those of us who are new to the committee stuckage. Yes. <laughs> yep, so there's a consultant on board that's looking at potential alternatives to. Uh, help to mitigate that that how, how long is, that's been, that problem's been around for a while right it has so is this consultant going to find a new a well new so the, there's been incremental steps that have been taken throughout the years in terms of um, you know signage and notification well in advance of um you know i, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think a boy could be tired as I kind of going further and further thousand dollars for patty <laughs> But I think they're looking at, you know, more substantial infrastructure type changes that might be able to, um, you know, more closely look at truck dimensions prior to getting to that point. Uh -huh. So it, it, it is a planning effort at this stage, but it's looking at a wide range of alternatives. And that's another, so that's a piece that is also being managed by the Office of Highway Safety. Um, so that be, might be one that they could provide a little bit more insight in terms of, you know, the specifics on the alternatives that are being considered or at least looked into at this stage. So the last project on this list is in Swanton, and this is at the um, exit 21 um, intercha interchange. And this is a regionally proposed project um, that's advancing through the project refinement stage. Moving on to the last page, we have a project in Waitsfield, also a regionally proposed project that's listed in d &E. This is at the intersection of Route 100 and Route 17. So we're showing PE funds within FY24. Wallingford, Rutland Town is a signal replacement or upgrade project that will address three signals along the US 7 corridor. Um, this is listed as a d &E project with PE funds in FY24. Four. Uh, Weathersfield, similar scope. Um, this is at the intersection of Vermont 131 and US 5. Um, we're working through PE currently. In Williston, we have um, improvements to the Vermont 2A and Industrial Ave intersection. Um, I know we mentioned the US, the, the US 2 Industrial Ave. This is on the other side of Industrial Ave. Um, so we are working through uh, PE within FY24. And the last project on this list is also in Williston, and this is at the US2 and Trader Lane intersection. And this is one you'll see that is actually utilizing state funds. And this is in coordination with um, some developer work that's ongoing in Williston um, that will help to kind of build out that grid street network off of uh, Marshall Ave and kind of behind the Texas Roadhouse and, and such. So that's what I have. All right. I think so that reaches the end. The first total of right the grand total. Okay. Yep. So the Space. total budget we're we're at about um, forty six and a half million dollars, and the majority of that again is is federally funded. Thank you so much. I see there might be a couple questions. So I think you see Representative Pouch and Representative Bartholomew. Thank you. Can you just describe 
you know how uh, some projects don't go through the DNE, but some do, and what percentage of ones that are on the DNE actually move forward? So the so the DNE list are projects that will have funding. They, so, all right. so so there's a commitment at, at already. Correct. Correct. It's just the the construction window is not defined, or right. it's outside that window. So that could mean one of two things. It could mean it's a complex project that you know will take a lot of resources in terms of design, permitting, and right of way that pushes it out beyond that window. Or it could be, and this is the case with a lot of these signal replacement jobs, um, they were recently programmed, so a, a full schedule is not defined at the time of this budget. So they're listed as D and E, and we're advancing them from a design perspective. And within the next budget cycle, we'll have construction plans. Not all of them, but a portion of them will pop into the project. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, Representative Bartholomew. Looking at the uh, statewide Governor's Highway Safety Program, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money. Can you say more about it? It's six and a half million dollars. Yeah, yeah, and uh, this is to Representative Shaw's comment. Um, I I can provide a breakdown. Uh, I'll get a breakdown and provide it to the committee in terms of kind of how that money is allocated and and um, distributed. But the appropriate team to kind of talk about that will be the Office of Highway Safety. So I can get you the preview of kind of how that six million is broken down, and then that group will be able to, you know, fill in the details on that when they come in to speak with you. So the ad to the Super Bowl. Yeah. So the, uh, so that's the educational piece, and you know where some of the money goes towards. Oh, Got to ask how they spent six ad. million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it works like that, but yeah. <laughs> if it did, we got some. Um, yeah. We got some questions about that. Well, Jesse, this is great. It's really, and it's also really nice to spend so much of our day uh, with you. So thank you so much for this. If, if, if we have, um, I mean, I know I have a question for about uh, in relationship to a bill that's coming to our committee that I might want to talk to you about that might be able to, be talk about. I might, so I might be reaching out to you, but if other committee members, we have your info. Absolutely. So uh, I know that was a little bit dry and there's not a lot of detail with it. So if there's questions about individual projects, you can reach out to me, or if they're front of the book, they will also have contact information for the project manager. Okay. Well, thank you so much, you so much. And, um, and for the committee, you'll notice that uh, Chris Roop joined us on Zoom. And, um, and so the item that we were gonna do before, um, I mean, that we were gonna do before lunch, um, we're going to do now, which is um, which is a uh... sure, sure, yeah. So, um, so hi, Chris. We're just getting situated. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, you're not with us in person. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, I'm not with you in person either. I've fortunately, it's not COVID, but something's going around. So, don't want to. Sp I would rather spare you all from. Picking up and contracting whatever has been lodged in my throat the last couple of days. Yeah. No, thank you for not sharing. It's always better to stay home. Um, so there's some there's some documents on our um, our committee webpage, and for those who who get, else gets printed copies, do they, I think you do, Leonard. I think these guys have some. So okay, and, and here's Anthea too. All right. So just as those go around, so. Just to kind of set set us up, the committee might recall we had um, I think last last it was last week. Gosh, weeks go, feel there's a lot that we pack into a week. So it was we had a um, drive through of um, a bill that's in House Judiciary Committee H fifty three, um, an act relating to driver license suspensions, um, and we got to hear we got. We got a walkthrough from uh, Anthea about the bill, and we had a member, uh, Representative Dolan, who's a bill sponsor and on that committee in here. And just to remind everybody, this was about the proposal to eliminate suspensions of driver's license um, licenses um, based on non-payment of amounts due for traffic violations. So this is a bill that's been enacted. And um, for new members, when, there are sometimes when bills have a fiscal impact, 
And so our joint fiscal office will do a fiscal note to, um, and th so this is one such bill. And um, Chris is, Chris Roop is the author of this bill. So I will pause there. I just want to remind people of what we were doing. And I think this is a bill that's not in our committee, but we often, we all, when there's a nexus or when there's something that touches on our committee, like in this case, transportation funding, um, we, the, uh, the, the committee of jurisdiction, our committee will, in this case, will um, will have a look at it. Um, so, Chris, I wanted to invite you to to kind of go through this the, this fiscal note for the committee, um, and then we might want to have some some discussion. Um, so, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Chris Fruit from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, Madam Chair, as you very correctly summarized, um, the. Uh, the Joint Fiscal Office is typically asked to do a fiscal note for legislation that is going to move through a committee, move out of a policy committee and through a money committee. We do, know, we do not do fiscal notes for every bill upon introduction, um, and we typically do them at the request of uh, the respective committee chairs. Um, the committee chair of the House Judiciary Committee reached out um, about a week and a half ago um, requesting a fiscal note on H-53. Um, you will see a draft of it um, with draft watermarks everywhere and sort of a, a placeholder at the heading that will be populated when a committee does decide to recommend the bill. I did not want to get ahead of the committee, so that's why there's a lot of weird sort of draft things going on up there. But uh, as you noted, uh, Madam Chair, uh, this legislation um, would end the ability to suspend driver's licenses purely based on the ability to pay amounts due from moving violations, from traffic violations for which points um, can be issued. This bill would not absolve people from the financial responsibility of having to pay those amounts due. Um, it just means you could not get a license suspension due solely for failure to pay amounts due. You can still get your license suspended for accumulating, you know, 10 points. You can still get your license suspended for uh, DUIs and whatnot, for behavioral offenses. What this legislation is, is very narrowly targeted to dealing with the issue of people having their licenses suspended due solely to failure to pay. So bottom line up front, the, um, we expect that the fiscal impact of this legislation would be approximately $200,000 of foregone revenue to the T fund. Um, that amount will fluctuate from year to year. Um, there's this, there's like two pages of this fiscal note goes into the data limitations and the caveats around how difficult it is to predict this with any real precision. But uh, this was sh this analysis was shared with the Judicial Bureau and with DMV. And I think we, we're all sort of at consensus that that's the ballpark figure. Um, why does that cost money? Um, if you have fewer, uh, well, let me step back. Whenever you have your license suspended and you apply to DMV to have your license reinstated, you may owe an $80 reinstatement fee that gets deposited into the transportation fund. Now, not every license that gets reinstated pays the full $80. Uh, the legislation or the, the statutes do allow for reduced payments for it to be waived uh, for, for various criteria. But the fiscal nexus to the T fund is the fact that if you have fewer licenses suspended, logically there will be fewer reinstatement fees paid to reinstate those licenses. So $200,000 a year, roughly, um, in the scope of a $300 million um, T fund. The, there's a few other items that are, are sort of flagged in here where, um, and I'm not going to go too into the weeds, um, especially on the judicial fees, because that's really not my wheelhouse. That's my colleague Dan's wheelhouse. But um, according to testimony from uh, both DMV and the Judicial Bureau to the House Judiciary Committee, um, they do not expect um, really significant impacts to administrative costs as a result of this. Um, so many of the back end processes are, uh, for dealing with license suspensions are automated. Um, really, DMV expects that they'd save some postage from having to generate and mail out fewer suspension letters every year. Uh, you know, I think you can do the math and, and realize that that'd be a pretty de minimis impact. You're probably dealing with 
low thousands of dollars um, in, in the scope of a department that has an over $40 million budget. Um, the Judicial Bureau may have some uh, relatively minor one-time costs associated with reprinting some pre-printed tickets to have revised information on the back um, and some possible one-time uh, system configuration costs to modify its data exchange with DMV. But this legislation is not expected to have a very significant impact on um, the administrative costs of either department. I do flag here as sort of a known unknown uh, fiscal risk is that the legislation could impact uh, collections to the court related special funds if it induces behavior to change. I am going very out of my way to not make assumptions about whether behavior will change, but think of it in terms of uh, if you have, even though this legislation would not absolve anybody of having to pay the amounts due, if the failure or if the if the threat of having a license suspension is removed, it could cause people to either enroll in greater levels in payment plans um, or uh, uh, there could be some increases or changes in delinquent behavior. Um, the Judicial Bureau does have the ability to recover um, amounts due through other means. Um, they have uh, really been a lot more aggressive in recent years about going after tax offsets. Um, of course, you need a Vermont tax refund in order to go after, but that has been a relatively effective strategy for them. So it wouldn't necessarily impact the total amount people have to pay to those other funds but it might have some impacts to the timing of those collections. But for, for the interests of this committee, I think the, the, the number one thing to keep in mind is uh, roughly $200,000 a year uh, revenue loss from just fewer reinstatement fees being collected. And that's okay. the fiscal note in a nutshell. Okay, um, so I, I, there might be a couple of questions about one of the first ones I have is so, would this have an impact on this fiscal year if this is passed or would it be the following? Um, fiscal year, do you know? I, if there's any impacts to this fiscal year, I expect them to be really, really small. The bill does take effect on passage. Um, so, you know, we don't know when on passage would be, but we're getting pretty close to the end of the fiscal year. So um, I expect most of the impacts would be prospective. And again, we're dealing with a pretty small amount of money um, in the big picture of the T fund. So I should have been clear. I think it's like, but the it would have an impact on FY24. So on the but on, on the revenue of, in FY twenty four, correct? It it would it would. Is it or it would it would right? Okay. Yep. And um, moving forward after that. And moving forward after that. So. One other thing I would just flag, Madam Chair, is that this this sort of this is one of many many small revenue items that goes into the sort of bucket of miscellaneous T fund revenues. Um, any one of those individual items can be pretty hard to predict from year to year. And exhibit, and exhibit quite a bit of volatility from year to year. So, you know, I don't want anybody to think that VTrans makes their decisions whether or not to pursue a project based solely on whether enough tickets are being written on any given year. I mean, these, yeah. are, these are revenue projections that are made with a lot of variables, a lot of sort of historic data in mind. So um, obviously a $200,000 hit would have to be made up for somehow, but that is well within the range of what is managerially yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah. So I hear what you're saying, but it is it is in our, uh, the budget that we're look, looking at. And I, I, your point, I think what you're saying is that those are projections, you never know if $200,000 is coming, is coming in. So I know that this, to put this in context, I know because of, I'd served on house corrections and institutions, you know, there's a look at like some of the fees that we were assessing um, and looking at, we were assessing some of the fees for people to be supervised coming out of incarcerated, incarcerated setting, settings and a number of other places. And I think um, one, this is kind of part of a, 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 a number of other pieces of legislation being considered is if that's really, if that's really the way we want to be getting revenue coming in to, um, to the, in certain areas. So I think that's the, that's a little bit of context. But the other question I had, Chris, for you is like, you know, we have taxes and we have fees and like the, this $80 fee that we're assessing for what sounds like it doesn't cost up the state anything to do. Like, it sounds like it's a very simple back office uh, procedure. I mean, 
I guess I'm big asking the question that you probably can't answer, but like, how do we, how do we figure out what these fees should be? And like, you know, when is it a tax and when is it a fee? And do you have any thoughts on that? Like, yeah, you know, you know that's a really good question. I'm going to defer to my colleague, Anthea from Ledge Council, who was kind enough to join us. You know, I think something to keep in mind is the transportation world with fees can look a little different than a lot of other worlds with fees where, you know, it doesn't cost $80 for, you know, what you pay in your driver's license fees or your registrations doesn't purely cover the cost of, you know, the person who's processing your application. Um, DMV collects far more in fee revenue than they spend, but it supports the rest of the transportation program in general. So motorists um, are paying these fees and not only does it go to sort of the regulatory function of DMV, but that money also goes to support the condition of the roads, the basic maintenance, as you all know, a portion of the state police budget um, to also enforce motor vehicle laws. So the, you know, the interpret, it's, it's not like the fee very, very narrowly covers the, the specific cost of the specific transaction. These fees sort of support the transportation sphere writ large and, it, and they are, Anthea can get more into the weeds of this, but I think one of the key distinctions of a tax or a fee is a fee tends to be a charge that's assessed for a service or a product on a specified class of individuals or entities. It's not, you know, unlike a tax, which is imposed on everybody, you know, here you're, you're, these fees are being imposed on motorists. And, uh, you know, having a driver's license is a privilege. It's not a right. So oh, I know Anthea is joining us by Zoom, and I know she has some a, 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 a little person who is homesick with her. So I don't know if she's. Yep. Oh, so I'm oh. here. Um, yes, great. Okay, so Anthea Dexter Cooper from the Office of Legislative Council. I do have someone with me, so I'm going to keep my uh, video off. Um, I don't have a ton more to add beyond what um, Chris said. So in statute, and Chris did get most of this definition, maybe from, from memory, which is impressive. In 32 VSA section 602 subdivision 2A, it says a fee is a monetary charge by an agency or the judiciary for a service or product provided to or the regulation of specified classes of individuals or entities. There is not a definition of tax in statute but Black's law, de law Dictionary defines tax as a pecuniary burden laid upon individuals or property to support the government and is a payment exacted by legislative authority. Essential characteristics of a tax are that it is not a voluntary payment or donation, but an enforced contribution exacted pursuant to legislative authority. So as Chris was getting to, there is, there's a lot of blur there. Um, you do have the fact that this is a fee associated with the, I guess, service or product provided to someone, which is the reinstatement of a license. It doesn't say in the statute, in the definition of fee, that a fee needs to be no more, no less than the cost to the administration to provide that service or product. However, the balance of the chapter in public monies on fees in Title 32, when it's looking at the justification for fees, requires information from the administration as to why a fee is being set where it is. Since you're not getting, for the last few years, anything from the administration saying our costs have gone up or a justification of what the fee should be, you're not really in a position to know if they think their administrative costs are in line with that $80 amount. You're now hearing that it doesn't really cost that much to reinstate a license. So I think that those are some of the considerations to, to weigh here. The final thing that I will add is that in Title 32, there's some language that I have never understood and I would love to know the derivation of it. It was added in 2006, and it says that the following charges are exempt from the provisions of the subchapter on executive and judicial branch fees. And then it goes on to say, except for the purposes of section 605, that's the fee report of this title, motor vehicle and other highway user fees authorized by the General Assembly for the support of the transportation fund. 
I don't know how broad that exception is. Is it saying that a fee doesn't need to be linked to a service or product that's being provided? Is it saying it doesn't need to be tethered to the administrative cost? I'm not sure. I haven't been able to find anything in statute that helps me answer that question. But there is that distinctive language that's different for the fees related to the transportation fund in Title 32. Okay, nothing is ever simple, is it? <laughs> Not with this. <laughs> All right. Um, well, do committee members have questions for either Chris or Anthea on this? I think, I think well, we don't have possession of this bill. Um, I think we should probably uh, take a straw poll of the committee, you know, and if, or if we need more information, vote uh, from the committee. Um, if the committee's ready, when the committee's ready. So, but this is a time to have ask some questions. Um, are there any other questions I'm seeing? Well, I don't question? think I'm going to take a straw poll yet. I'd like to read this and kind of okay. digest it and at least read the bill. I mean, read the bill again. We had a walkthrough with Anthea last, last week. I, I, don't, I don't think I was here. Right, so we, we, we got a pretty, and we had, so, just, so we have it on the, we have the bill and, um, and we had that testimony and we had a member from House Judiciary come in. Um, we can have somebody come in again, but I know. No, that's not necessary. Yeah, no, it's not reading the bill. And yeah, 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 that's why I wanted to yeah. get this out there before the committee, but we wanted to have this opportunity to, to do this. And then to overnight, I think that the House Judiciary Committee is hoping to vote this out possibly before the end of the week. So, go ahead. I'm sorry, so we did have a, somebody that came in from the, the committee and whatnot, but did the DMV make an opinion on um, Yeah, they have no opinion. No yeah, they were okay, here in the room. That's fine. Okay. Yep, so um, Deputy, she sat over there when she said Deputy that. Commissioner Smith and I, I think Commissioner Manoli was in for private, but um, uh, were here. They were also in, um, as I think it's in this fiscal note, they were also in um, House Judiciary giving testimony and they were neutral on it. Um, but that's a good question. So just to remind of, of all of well, us. They, didn't, they, didn't, they were over there when they did that. Mm -hmm. okay. She said they were neutral before the $200,000 hit to them. It yeah, I didn't yeah. know about that. <laughs> okay, so they didn't know this. this. I, I, Not that I, I, I can't think that. I just remember there was some uncertainty about when she came in from the committee about where it was going to go or how quickly or whatever they were doing. At the time. From who? From the commissioner? No, from the, when she was testifying from the committee, they saying it's bill's not finished yet or it's not ironed out yet or something to that effect. Was, so that was last week and right. so they worked on it. I mean, but I don't think, okay. I don't think the, the language of the bill, I, let's ask Anthea though. Anthea, um, has the language of the bill changed since you came in to our committee? No, it is not. And I haven't been asked to uh, draft any amendments yet. So I think if they vote it out tomorrow, it is as it was introduced without any amendments. One. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And and um, I don't know. Uh, I can I can check to see Chris when you did the fiscal note. Um, did had DMV weighed in on the the money piece? I I thought that they that they had, but does that help me understand that? Because I, I don't I'm, recall. I don't recall if DMV took a position of you know, support or opposition to the bill. I mean, they have weighed in on the fiscal analysis and provided me the data that I requested and reviewed the fiscal note. I think we're in agreement of the dollar figures. Um, I just don't recall if they took a position on the pol the underlying policy issue. And one thing to sort of keep in mind is uh, the, the revenue collected from this fee goes to the T-Fund and DMV obviously is supported from appropriations from the T-Fund, but it's not like this money goes directly to DMV for DMV to keep the way like professional licensing, uh, licensure fees might work, um, staying in sort of their those separate accounts. So this sort of goes into the bigger pot, um, the, the big $300 million mixing bowl that you all then get to figure out how to divvy up and DMV gets a piece of that. It's really our decision, is what you say. It's really the legislature's decision about because we're dealing with the the our budget is the, the revenue coming, uh, funding funding some of this. I think the interesting question for me would be, Gary, did you talk about 
there, there may not be any linkage between the fee and the, and the cost of the actual work yeah. uh, is a two hundred thousand dollar. So I don't if they don't do the work, is there any hit to the DNV budget because they haven't provided a service? Uh, and but it may be a, a I, I don't know. That's the that's the underlying question I'd like to figure. I think, and I think Representative Shaw, what Anthea was was alluding to, and I certainly don't speak for her, was that the statute interprets this pretty liberally when it comes to the transportation space, where you're not just paying a fee based on the cost of somebody at a window at DMV to process whatever you're giving them to process. You are also contributing. That fee is also going toward the maintenance and regula the regulation of the entire transportation network that that motorist is then using. But it does raise, an, you know, it, it raises an interesting question about whether, yeah. whether it should have been an $80 uh, fee to begin with, right? I mean, that's, we can chuckle about that, but and that's, that's yeah. what's coming up for me, I think. Well, it seems like it was maybe very punitive in some ways, right? That it, that maybe the philosophy was a little bit like, you know, you lost your license, now you're going to pay eighty dollars. You know. So this is. Yeah. Is that? Do I have it right? That. Go ahead, please. Right? Yeah. So, do I, am I interpreting this correctly? That forty three percent of of suspensions are for non-payment of unique individual suspensions yes so four thousand people three thousand nine hundred and ninety nine people individuals have lost their licenses because of just non-payment uh in calendar 22 yeah they were suspended for um those are unique individuals um suspended due to non-payment of traffic violations those numbers are down significantly from where they were about a decade ago yeah, but and that's I think the reason. I mean, what we have to pay eighty dollars to get well, reinstated. Well, what we heard though is that you know because it still points on a person's license, right? So if they if they if they if they get ten points on their license, their license will be removed. But this is just addressing that one time and and the you know having this moving violation and having um, having to have your like having your license suspended for non-payment of a fee and. We did hear from the sponsor of the bill um, that they there was data that shows like people then can't get to work. I mean, right. we hear about that in transportation, like you know that you know uh, the people are not able to get to work because um, of a suspended license. So I mean, we could do a couple things. We could hear we could hear again from somebody from judiciary. We could certainly have um, DM if people do want to hear from the deputy commissioner. Commissioner, uh, we can see if they could come in tomorrow. But I at least want to give people an overnight to think about this. It's a four-page fiscal note, and and then we'll probably will not be taking um, a roll call committee vote on this. It'll be it would be a straw poll. So, um, but we we have a little bit of time if people have more questions for Chris or Anthea. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. I'm looking around the room. I'm not seeing any questions. You know, this is where we, you know, we have to weigh some things as a committee, right? And we're, we're um, and that that will be where we uh, will we'll, uh, have to come to a dis. You know, you will each have to come to a decision on how you want to how you think about this. So, um, all right. Well, with that. I give you 15 minutes before oh, the floor, oh. and then it's okay, right? So, um, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> right? It's nice to have a little bit so of a break. So, rather than like retail, you have like zero minutes between. Oh, exactly. Like overlap minutes here. You know, it's so nice to have a little bit of breathing room. So, with that, um, thank you, Chris and Anthea, for for joining. I hope you hope to see you in person soon, um, and. Um, Thank you again. Um, and with that, I think we will um, end our lives. I did. Okay.